Hi, Chris Potts here. This screencast walks through the handout overview of topics. The discussion is intended as a way of trying to give you a sense for what the material in this course is like and why it has broader significance. The discussion will be completely informal. These are all topics that we'll return to in much greater depth later in the quarter. So for now, just try to use this as a chance to get in touch with your own intuitions about linguistic meaning. In section one of the handout, Kinds of Meaning, I'm mainly signaling that we'll take a very expansive view of meaning in this course. The term semantics is often reserved for the fixed, conventional aspects of language, and the term pragmatics is then a kind of cover term for meanings that arise when people use language to communicate with each other. I think this is fine as a rough first pass, as long as we recognize that semantics can be highly variable and uncertain, and that the usage-based meanings that we're dubbing pragmatics are highly diverse. If we then focus in on a particular utterance that is a particular communicative act, we find that there are lots of meaning-related questions that we can pose. What does the utterance claim or ask or demand? And that's just a small sample of the things one might aim to do with one's utterance. There are also things like promising, threatening, sentencing to prison, other complex things one can do solely with language if the conditions are right. What does the utterance presuppose? That is, what does the speaker appear to be taking for granted as uncontroversially true and shared knowledge among all the dis participants in the discourse as part of the utterance they're making? We'll see that presuppositions, as we'll call them, are very powerful devices for communicating, but also for manipulating. What does the utterance suggest or imply? These are colloquial terms for meanings people convey off the record, so to speak, that is outside of what their utterance literally encoded. We'll find lots of subtle distinctions in this space, and we'll tease out the consequences for social life more broadly, especially as it pertains to language and the law. Finally, finally at least for now, what are the connotations of the utterance? What associations do the word choices instill in people? And I'm happy to have us go even further afield. As we travel out from these usage-based meanings, we can connect with sociolinguistics, with the construction of style and personal identity, and the way that language can contribute to those phenomena. And as you'll see also, we will also find lots of ways in which meaning and use for language relate to port important societal phenomena. I mentioned the law. We can also connect with politics, advertising, education, language technology, and lots of other areas. In section two of the handout, we begin a core topic in semantics, entailment. This is one of the most important topics in all of semantics and indeed for all studies of meaning. And so it has its own screencast. So I'm going to skip past this and just urge you to watch the screencast on this topic as a way of getting a feel for this fundamental concept. Let's move then to section three, modifier. This will be our first major unit for the course. We'll use it as a chance to get a feel for the principle of compositionality and its role in language. For now though, let's just consider the attributive modifier examples in eight. We have the core noun us by, and we're considering the meanings of various modified versions of it, nearsighted spy, alleged spy, former spy, fake spy, and porcelain spy. And to focus the discussion, we can ask which if any of these modifiers entails that the entity referred to is in fact a spy. So for nearsighted spy, the answer seems to be clearly yes. It seems like the meaning of nearsighted spy is derived from us simply considering the set of things that are both nearsighted and spies, and then the phrase is perhaps referring to one of those entities. So that's a clear yes entailment. For alleged spy, the answer seems to clear again, but here the answer is clearly no, there's no entailment for spy. Alleged spy means something like the set of things that someone has accused of being a spy. The accusations can be true or false, so clearly we can't make any inferences at all about whether these entities are in fact spies. At first, former spy seems like a clear case too. A former spy seems like it would be someone who was once a spy and is no longer one, so it would entail not a spy. However, suppose we're talking about a person who worked for the CIA, resigned, and then returned to the organization. Could that person attend parties for former spies, for example? A clearer case might be former department chair. If I'm a department chair and then I step down and then I take up the role again, can I attend parties for former department chairs even if I'm currently in the role? In a similar vein, for those of you who aren't finishing school this year, you can ask yourselves whether you are future students in virtue of the fact that you will be students next year, setting aside that you're students now. The case of fake is even trickier. Is a fake gun a gun or porcelain? A porcelain mug is a mug, but a porcelain gun probably is not a gun. What about a porcelain knife? 
it might actually depend on whether the object can fulfill the goal one has set for it. I can't promise that we'll resolve all these issues, but I can provide a framework for thinking about all this uncertainty and how people grapple with it. In 9 and 10, we consider the case of noun compounds, where the overall meanings are in many ways even less predictable than for those attributive modifiers. A banana cake is probably a cake made with bananas. A skillet cake, though, is not made of skillets, but rather a skillet is probably used to make it. A birthday cake is named after the occasion. You can't have a cake made of or with birthdays, so the occasion is really the only option. And then a pumpkin cake, that could be a cake in the shape of a pumpkin or a cake made with pumpkin. That's probably the case for banana cake too. Uh, could a pumpkin banana cake be one that was shaped like a pumpkin and made with bananas? I'm not sure. In talking about this, I didn't mean to neglect our explosive dog in nine. This is a picture of a very patient looking dog wearing a vest that says explosive dog. And I'm hoping that this puppy can detect explosives and is not made of them. Uh, Okay, those were nominally semantic topics, but you can already see how much usage and context play into meaning, even for these semantic things. Let's turn to the topic of usage in general, that is the topic of pragmatics. To a first approximation, pragmatics is the study of the ways in which we enrich the conventionalized meanings of the things we say and hear into their fuller intended meanings. And this kind of enrichment is pervasive and strikingly systematic, and it's key to natural languages being the flexible, expressive, cognitive tools that they are. For introducing pragmatics, I really like this analogy from Stephen Levinson's book, Presumptive Meanings. Levinson presents us with this Rembrandt sketch, and he writes, We interpret the sketch instantly and effortlessly as a gathering of people before a structure, probably a gateway. The people are listening to a single declaiming figure in the center. And then he continues, but all this is a miracle, for there is little detailed information in the lines or shading, such as there is, every line is a mere suggestion. Yeah, and if you look closely at this picture, you can see that nothing is really clearly represented here. It's really just a lot of squiggles. Levinson continues, so here's the miracle. From a mere sketchy a squiggle of lines, you and I converge to find adumbration, that is representation, of a coherent scene. And here's the core analogy for Levinson. The problem of utterance interpretation is not dissimilar to this visual miracle. An utterance is not, as it were, a veridical model or snapshot of the scene it describes. Rather, an utterance is just as sketchy as the Rembrandt drawing. Exactly. And we could push this analogy a bit further, too. If the whole world were covered in barcodes, then computer vision would be easy. And if all meaning were encoded directly in semantic content, then natural language processing would be easy. In truth, for both of these domains, the cognitive enrichment we do based on the sketchy signals we do receive is almost the whole story. I can't resist here two fun, randomly chosen examples. So in 11, we see two book covers. On the left, the book title is What They Teach You at Harvard Business School. On the right... The title is What They Don't Teach You at Harvard Business School. And this clever tweet says, These two books contain the sum total of all human knowledge. Of course, the tweeter has adopted the pretense that these two phrases quantify or over everything in the universe, and that's what makes it funny. In fact, we all recognize that the quantification is much more restricted. And this kind of restricted quantification is indeed the norm for quantifier phrases. To take another salient example, if I say everyone did the homework, I surely don't mean everyone in the universe, but rather only everyone in the class. And that set will vary depending on which class context I'm in. So here you can see that even our understanding of the basic semantics of these utterances is dependent on context to restrict those quantifier domains. In 12, we have a real life example of a pragmatic effect that's well studied in the literature, but maybe not so frequently attested. This example was found by Julia Gong, who's an alum of this course and an expert example spotter. This is a tweet uh, uh, that's reviewing the movie Cats, and it says, Cats is undeniably a film, brimming with a score, cinematography and performances. It's a motion picture made by a team of filmmakers that can irrefutably be described as existent. Truly one of the films 2019 has to offer. Now, we easily infer that the person writing this tweet thinks Cats is a bad movie. Yet no negative things are said. 
What is it in the mixture of emphatic and language and mundane, obviously presupposed facts that leads us to this high level inference about the evaluation? I mentioned above that there are rich connections we can make between meaning and broader societal concerns, and a major area for that is language and the law. It's a striking and deep fact about our society that we have many laws that turn, in whole or in part, on whether someone did or meant something in particular with their utterance. Think of threats, bribery, coercion, perjury. There are lots of examples. Now, this fact might be disconcerting to you if you reflect on the fact that all of the law and all of the things that people say in courts of law are just utterances, and that means they're mere sketches of what was intended and what people perceive. The Supreme Court's record in the U.S. on recognizing the context-dependent nature of language use is frankly sort of mixed, but here we have a clear statement that we can get behind. This is from Solon and Tiersma's wonderful book, Speaking of Crime, which we'll revisit throughout the quarter. The quotation says, Language, of course, cannot be interpreted apart from context. The meaning of a word that appears ambiguous if viewed in isolation may become clear when the word is analyzed in the light of the terms that surround it. To give you a sense for how deep this can run, let's look briefly at a famous case that relates to the nature of perjury, Bronston versus the United States. I'll first read the context. The defendant, Samuel Bronston, was president of Samuel Bronston Productions Incorporated, a movie production company. He had personal as well as company bank accounts in various European countries. His company petitioned for bankruptcy. At the bankruptcy hearing, the following exchange occurred between the lawyer for the creditor and Bronston. Okay, we need to watch Bronston's utterances very carefully. The lawyer says, Do you have any bank accounts in Swiss banks, Mr. Bronston? And Bronston replies, No. The lawyer follows up, Have you ever? And Bronston replies, The company had a bank account there for about six months in Zurich. Importantly, everything Bronston says here is truthful. However, it came out that, earlier, Bronson had a large personal bank account in Switzerland for five years where he had deposited and drawn checks totaling more than $180,000. So here's the question. Did Bronson perjure himself? This is an interesting and pressing question that should have a straightforward answer, whereas lying and deception might be kind of clearly subjective and hard to pin down as concepts, the definition of perjury should be part of the law, and one might hope that it would settle the matter entirely. But of course it doesn't. I've given here Solon and Tiersma's paraphrase of the legal definition of perjury, that's in 13b, and the highlights are that one must be under oath, and willfully and contrary to such oath, state or subscribe to any material matter which he does not believe to be true. And furthermore, the false statement must be material that is relevant. Well, in a bankruptcy hearing, we can assume that one's bank accounts are material that is relevant. So the question is, did Bronson commit himself to anything that he does not believe to be true? That's a tough call. The lawyer asked whether he had ever had any Swiss bank accounts, and he gave an answer to a different question. He said something about his company. And what he said about the company was true. Now, we could speculate that Bronston knew his audience would enrich his indirect answer to no but, as in no, but the company had one. However, he didn't say that, and it's not a lawful fact about English that no but gets tacked onto the front of any indirect answer like this. So we're left wondering about his intentions. And the courts were left wondering too. Bronston was originally found guilty of perjury, The case was appealed, and the original decision was upheld in that appeal, and it eventually made its way to the Supreme Court. And the ruling there is sort of amusing. Bronston was found to be not guilty of perjury by the Supreme Court, and the decision more or less said that it was the lawyer's responsibility to push for clarification when Bronston was indirect in answering. Let's move to another topic at the semantics-pragmatics border, that's presupposition. And I'll again introduce this for now with some interesting examples. If you're like me, you find the New York Times headline in 14 to be annoying. It says, who wants to go swimming? We do too. It's not annoying if they leave off to, as in who wants to go swimming? We do. Then it's just sort of odd. But with that too, they seem to be conveying that they believe I already committed myself somehow to wanting to swim, but I didn't do that with the New York Times. In the terms we'll develop, the two in this context introduces the presupposition that I committed publicly to wanting to go swimming, 
And so the Times is using it in a way that's sort of manipulative. Here's another manipulative case. Confirm your eBay transaction. If you get an email that says this, you might start to worry. To make sense of the email, you have to accommodate the presupposition that you actually have an eBay transaction. Even if you don't have one, you might find yourself taking on that commitment as a way of making sense of the utterance. And of course, the spammer hopes that you'll take action on the basis of that false assumption and perhaps get yourself into some trouble. A final case for now, 16 is a very funny response from Olive Garden in response to a parody tweet. And the parody tweet reads, Respect to Olive Garden for no longer selling AR-15s at all their locations. Olive Garden would badly like us to know that they have never sold such weapons. But what can they do in response to this tweet if they said, it's false that Olive Garden no longer sells AR-15s as an attempt to directly refute the tweet, they would then commit themselves to having sold AR-15s in the past, right? Even though they used a negation, the presupposition would persist. The presupposition is very entrenched in the discourse and simple denials just won't target it. And that's why they have to do all this careful legal verbiage here to convey their view of the parody tweet without falling into the trap of adopting its presuppositions. On to section six, speech acts. This is another area of extreme uncertainty and extreme importance to the law. To start, we need to distinguish the sentence type, which is a syntactic notion, from the sentence force, which is a pragmatic notion. So, for example, declarative is a sentence type, and I've given some examples here. Turtles are amazing. I wonder where Kim is. You should move your bicycle and you can have a cookie. Even though these all have the same sentence type, they differ pretty clearly in their force. For example, turtles are amazing sounds like an assertion. Whereas you can have a cookie is typically more like a suggestion, though depending on the context, you can probably make it sound like a threat. Interrogatives show similar variability. The standard thing that comes to mind is probably that they have questioning force, as in what day is today. But do you want to have ice cream could be an invitation, and could you help me could be a request. Imperatives are even more variable still. People generally think they associate with commands like move your bicycle, But have a cookie is unlikely to be a command, and get well soon hardly makes sense as a command. It's more like a well-wish or something in terms of its force. Now, what shapes this type to force connection? How do people figure out what the speaker means? The general answer is that we use context together with subtle clues about the linguistic form, but there's often residual uncertainty. And this brings us back to issues of language and the law, since the forces we consider could be things like threats, offers of bribes, and other illegal actions that are performed with words alone. Example 17 is intended to make this vivid. We imagine that a driver has been stopped for speeding, and what they say to the officer is, is there any way that we can sort this out here, officer? On the face of it, This is an interrogative sentence type, and it seems like it's a question. But does it have the force of an offer for bribery? It's very hard to say what the speaker's intentions are. It could be an innocent question. And actually, there may be some utility on both sides in this kind of indirectness. After all, if the driver directly offers a bribe, then the officer has no choice but to react in some extreme way because it's clearly a transgression. Since the driver has been indirect, the officer potentially can choose to ignore the apparent infraction. That's sort of a fun imagined example. We'll look at a case later with much more serious consequences. Consider the right of people in the U.S. to request a lawyer. Obviously, if you say, I hereby request to speak with a lawyer, you're likely to succeed in making this particular legally recognized speech act. But what if you're indirect, as in, can I meet with a lawyer, or maybe I should talk with a lawyer? In speaking of crime, we see cases where this is not regarded by the police as sufficient to invoke the right to counsel. That's a striking case of failure to allow pretty routine pragmatic inferences into this legal setting. Let's briefly branch out even further to consider the case of framing. This will get us into the more connotational meanings that I alluded to at the start, though I think it also involves presuppositions and other concepts from pragmatic theory. In 19, a politician says, half the Tories opposite are crooks. And the speaker says, please retract. And the politician replies, okay, half the Tories opposite aren't crooks. 
The two statements are truth conditionally identical, presumably, but they frame things in very different ways. Lots of framing is more lexical. For example, you might have noticed that Democrats refer to the Democratic Party, whereas the, their political opponents tend to use the phrase Democrat Party. Why? Well, first, the word democratic has many positive connotations in the U.S. context, and so it would be a strategic mistake for opponents of the party to be constantly handing the Democrats this gift of positive connotations. The other side of this is that it's striking that Democrat Party doesn't seem to, does indeed seem to lack these connotations, just a tiny suffix removed, and the connotations are radically different. Okay, I'll wrap up here. Assuming everything goes as planned, our final topic for the quarter will be swearing. This has always been a rewarding way to wrap up. Swears bring together essentially all the themes of the quarter, the technical concepts as well as the societal connections, and they do so with the added interest of linguistic taboos. So we'll ask big questions. What are swears? And how do they work? Semantically, pragmatically, socially, legally, and any other way we can think of. Why do they have so much power? And what is the nature of the taboos that surround them? If you're intrigued and you want to get started on this, feel free to skip down to the bottom of the course website and check out the podcasts and optional readings that we have lined up for swearing. They're a lot of fun and they don't presuppose any technical background in these topics.